Public Research with Daniel Schwartz. Episode 4 with expert and historian of the far right, Spencer Sunshine. Hey guys, it's Daniel. On this episode, I was really lucky to talk to Spencer Sunshine. You know, there are a lot of people that cover the far right and extremism these days ever since 2016, but there's not that many who've been paying attention at the level that Spencer has to the far right for over 17 years. So I was really happy to gain his perspective. I need to make a note for context that this interview was conducted about a year ago. So that's why we didn't talk about, you know, Kanye West and other things. Um, Having said that, enjoy. Here we go. Would you agree with me? The situation is so bad now that Trump is basically a moderate in his movement. I don't know that I would agree with that, but I think there are certainly plenty of people who are at his level and perhaps more. I mean, I think that there are more that, you know, you didn't really see the influence of Nick Fuentes and the Groypers. I think they only sort of came along near the end of his actual administration and you didn't see such close links. And now you, now you really do, um, like it was pointed out to me a while ago that in the past, if you somebody was like a, an aide to a Republican who and pointed out this aide had formerly been in uh, Patriot Front or something, he was immediately fired. And now that's not a situation that's necessarily going to happen. Like people are just like, yeah, whatever. Um, especially if they were formerly in the group. So things have feel like they have shifted further to the right. Um, I think kind of getting at the very end of of Trump's administration. Uh, Part of that was that he built a real base that wasn't clear at the very beginning of it. It kind of looked like just him, you know, with support at the very grassroots, but now, you know, organized political groups and members of Congress um, are, are Trumpist. And I don't know that Trump is a moderate in that, but he's, he's, you know, I wouldn't, I have a problem saying he's in the center of that. There's people who are more extreme than him. I mean, someone like Gosser, who I think is out now, is more extreme than him. And, and certainly Marjorie Taylor Greene is, if not on the same, then further to the right. I think she's probably further to the right. I think that's safe to say. So we've had these three mass shootings. Doug Mastriano, the Republican nominee for governor in Pennsylvania, has paid a rabid anti-Semite Andrew Torba, $5,000. And now he's released a statement, does not denounce Torba, doesn't really even distance himself. I've never seen a major party governor uh, nominee that's like openly, you know, he seems basically like I'm standing with Torba. I've never seen this. Have you? I cannot think of any examples. Um, I think that you're clearly right that people who are more mainstream Republicans are in alliance with people who are very, you know, explicitly white nationalist or anti-Semitic. It's not that necessarily they are giving such pure lines like that, right? Um, but yeah, I think that's a real that's a real shift. Um, that's that's something we haven't seen for. I think that's something. The fact that it's common is definitely something in the last three years, let's say. I'm going to like lap over with the end of the Trump administration, but I think it is getting more intense. The Gab stuff is, Gab's getting more openly anti-Semitic and more Republicans are on it, you know, to to appeal to a base. Um, We're definitely seeing more and more of that stuff, like that, that combination of the two. So you started focusing on this during the, the Bush administration or after? Um, Gosh, let me think who was in power. Uh, well, for a year, I got into politics um, by forming an, uh, what would now be called like a legal anti-fascist group or something. I mean, we, we used the rubric of anti-racist uh, in 1990, 1991 in the punk rock scene because where I was living was like a, a, one of the centers of Nazi skinhead organizing. Um, 
And I think I went on to other stuff. That's how I got into politics and did all kinds of things. I think the I first got back into writing about the far right around 2005 was my first article I published um, about a crypto fascist group that was cross recruiting anarchists and people in the anti globalization scene and radical ecologists. So um, who would that be? That would be Bush too, right? So yeah, it would be during Bush too. I sense, uh, as far as like the neo Nazis, they were so much further outside the mainstream in 2005 than today. So the this is this is what it looks like from a, a sort of back. You know, if you if you move really back and look at it. Um, so in the well, we'll start here in the late 70s. There's a combination for the first time of Nazi and Klan groups working together. Um, and as Reagan is elected in 1980, you know, he uses what now we would say is, is uh, you know, some racist stuff. But mostly he's like a, a neoliberal. He's trying to help implement neoliberalism and smash unions and smash the old Keynesian system of, you know, high wages and guaranteed for life jobs and, you know, unionized industries and stuff. Um, during this time, it's a good time for, for um, the far right. The neo-Nazi white supremacist movement expands during this time slowly through the 80s, sort of um, the, the Nazis in particular start to peak around 88, 90 as they get a, a big influx of, of the Nazi skinheads into it. But the Klan is also very, you know, um, gets more popular than it had been for a while and the movement gets really violent. In the mid 80s, there's a, a predecessor to the militia movement, the Posse Comitatus, who are very successful in the Midwest amongst farmers that are losing their farms. But the bulk of the right is still in the mainstream with Reagan, right? Um, so the this new wave of this wave of white supremacist, open white supremacist stuff kind of fades by 1990, by the mid 90s, and part of it is it gets overtaken by the militia movement in 1995 is the big Oklahoma City bombing by militia movement members who kill 168 people. That strangely energizes the militia movement and more people join it in the next year. And I think we're seeing some of this now in the aftermath of J6 when more people have joined groups like the Proud Boys. Like this isn't a totally uncommon dynamic. So the militia movement is then pretty popular until about 2000, 2001 gets a couple of blows that they thought in 2000, everything was going to collapse and it didn't. And then after September 11th, you know, um, Bush is in power and he's a neoliberal, so he's not sympathetic to their stuff. And, you know, everyone is blubber. Conservatives are all blocking behind him and very patriotic. So a kind of anti-system, you know, view even on the right isn't popular. And that kind of flatlines both the white organized white supremacist and the militia movement for quite a number of years, and it's Obama's re-election. So they're basically dead in the water, 2000 to 2008, under Bush, under W. Um, and in, Obama gets elected in 08, right? So he's sworn in in 09. And this creates a new, um, a new wave of the far right of militias, but also kind of the militias are more, a little more moderate than they were in the 90s, who themselves were more moderate than they were in the 70s and 80s. Um, and along with them, other groups. And so the Tea Party, which is largely forgotten today, was a pivotal movement with many, many people involved in it. It was the first real grassroots right wing, far right movement, a very moderate far right movement. I mean, Trump makes them look pretty mainstream, but they were they were pretty radical compared to uh, Bush or something. Um, and it was a very popular movement on the right. At the same time, the Oath Keepers form and uh, the Three Percenters form. And I think uh, Richard Max. Um, CSPOA, the sheriff's group, the group that thinks sheriffs can uh, um, negate federal law forms around that. So there's this whole new wave of the militia movement and of the far right. And most people in a more, even on the left or whatever, were just like, ah, oh, the Tea Party, they're just kind of wacky and they faded after a few years. But in reality, and it's true, that movement did, that space it opened um, just expanded. So around 2013, I joined a think tank that will remain nameless because we don't have a happy relationship, but um, we were seeing all kinds of activity on the far right and platforms with Breitbart became the most famous of them. We were like, wow, these platforms have like 
far more people than we ever seen in the past. Like they're really big internet based platforms. Like they're really big and no one's paying attention to them. Um, and so this, so really from 2010 to about 2016, when people were paying attention, there was consistent growth on the far right. Um, another pivotal moment was in 2014 when Gamergate happened. This is kind of forgotten, but it was incredibly important in retrospect where these, I think two women, one or two women who had written this feminist critique of some stuff in the game industry just got swamped by online trolls. It came out of 4chan, I believe. Milo Yiannopoulos was part of this. Um, and the kind of thing you were talking about before about all the memes being sent to people, these just horrific stuff, this happened to these feminist critics. It just overwhelmed in a swarming, um, a swarming attack. And I had a little bit of this done to me once, and it's a deeply unpleasant experience. And it certainly wasn't at the level that it happened. I mean, this is mass harassment where people have to kind of like almost go underground and shut everything off. You can't let people know where you live. You can't appear in public. Um, if it gets intense enough, it's really, it can really just, it really does disrupt your life. That tactic um, got used later in 2016. What happened is Gamergate, which is really a kind of anti feminist, you know, proto incel thing, um, it's part of like the, the men's rights movement or the, you know, manosphere, whatever you want to call it, combined with the white supremacists, the new wave of white supremacists, the alt right which before had been quite small and it was really just around some intellectuals like Richard Spencer and the two came together and that's what exploded so quickly in 2015 and 16 as they, they hooked onto Trump and Trump in turn and Bright Rupert in particular courted them. And cause it was a combination, the alt-right at that point was sort of Janus faced. I always say it's twice Janus faced on one hand, there were really open white supremacists, Richard Spencer, and even, to the right of him, you know, Daily Stormer and Andrew Anglin. And on the other side were more moderate people, you know, Gavin McGinnis. Um, people came out of this like Ben Shapiro or something, right? Laura Loomer. But they all agreed to work together and they helped get Trump elected. Trump at one point tweeted a meme of himself as Pepe the Frog. Like Breitbart ran an article written by Yiannopoulos just praising and, and sort of whitewashing the, the most extreme parts of the alt-right. If you go back and read it, it's pretty shocking. Um, this happened in 2015. So this helped give a real, I mean, it wasn't what elected Trump, but it, 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 it gave conservatives a new spin and helped open the space to a much further right politic that was embraced by the guy who became the president. And then um, this space continued up to Charlottesville, which was August 2017, so about six months into Trump's presidency. And it was only at that point that the GOP and they're backtracking on this now, finally decided that open white supremacists couldn't be a part of the movement. So they split the alt-right and they're basically like the alt-light, the wing of it that would allow in like Jews and people of color and gay men. That was totally fine in the party. Proud Boys and such, totally fine in the party. But the open white supremacists had to go. And they got blocked out for a number of years. And so, um, yeah, and so then we have Trump and then at first, it just really looks like Trump and some people in the base. But over the years, like he develops lots of elected officials in the party and people in the Republican Party structure itself. You know, there's a, a political structure in the RNC and even lower level stuff that's not they're not officials. They're they're officials in the party itself, but they're not elected officials. And so the Trumpists, in many cases, take over the party itself, the internal party structures. Um, and then we see this cult, you know, eventually culminate in, in the, uh, in one six to you know, the attempt to, to stymie the transfer of power to a Democrat. So that's what it looks like in a really, if you want to see the last 30 years, that's what it's really looking like as the far right. So first time the far right has really broken through on a national level in the past, you would occasionally see people elected to Congress or something, usually congressmen, not senators, but it rarely got further than that. Give me your thoughts on, the, did you see this Gen Z Nazi thing coming? It's like, it, it just surprised me that, that we would find like the most virulent, like open neo-Nazis would be Gen Z. I like did not see that coming. Well, what Fuentes is not, I mean, he's not an open neo-Nazi in any way. He does say occasional things that you would identify with neo-Nazism. I mean, Richard Spencer isn't either. There's an interview with him somewhere, and he's like, well, actually, the actual neo-Nazis don't like me. I'm too moderate. 
Um, which is true. He's more of a like generic in some ways white nationalist. And he does kind of down tone down the anti-Semitism. I mean, at, he still is an anti-Semite, but at times he, he overall, he tones it down. It's not his main talking point. Uh, I mean, after the alt right though, you're like, you know, clearly a lot of younger people were going to be involved in these kinds of politics. Um, and the whole online and still ironic part of it um, includes references to Nazism and also is and is not at the same time, right? They're always like playing with just seeing this stuff where they're playing with it and then saying it's a joke or they, you know, they're almost trying it out, you know, or they're using it occasionally and then doing other stuff all at the same time. So I guess I'm not totally surprised. I mean, Fuentes has been really good about attracting younger people and um, Patriot Front is too, who are the best organized sort of white nationalist street demonstration group. I mean, most of their, um, Fuentes' people are, are teenagers in very early 20s and Patriot Front, I think there are probably no one really over 30 in it. Um, Adam Waffen Division Two, which at some point had like 75 people, everyone arrested in that group. Many members were arrested, were under 30. Um, so yeah, I'm not totally surprised. Okay, are you more nervous meeting a boomer Republican or a Gen Z Republican that, as far as them, like secretly, you know, they'll, they'll act fine to you in person, but behind closed doors, they're like you know, posting Black Sun memes. Right. I think... All right. I mean, boomers, because the white supremacist thing wasn't so strong in their generation, I think are more likely just to be like the kind of everyday vulgar racist that Trump is or more extreme than that, right? But that same kind of everyday thing. Um, I think the younger people, I don't know that they're more likely to be that kind of a right winger, but I think if they are, they're going to be more virulent. Um, maybe there will be more. I don't know. I, I wouldn't, I don't think that the difference is that great. I do think the younger person will be more extreme. And even that can just be an age thing where older people tend to moderate a little bit, right? That's just not not uncommon on the left or right. So let's say one to a hundred. Let's just call it the I don't know. Racism, anti-Semitism scale. OK. OK. And let's say in 2005, it was at 25 or the number was 25. Right. What, what's that number today? If they're a gun to your head, what, what's the number at today? Well, if you start with 25, then today. I'm not sure who this is or judging what I easily double, maybe triple. Wow. How do you assess the situation? Like where the biggest threats are and what, what are your concerns going forward? Well, I mean, for sure, if you look at, you know, I like to compare things. I have a PhD in sociology. And one of the weird things I did take out of that is um, trying to get empirical numbers for stuff because we can have a lot of ideas and impressions and theories about stuff, but that doesn't necessarily give you the same kind of viewpoint than actually trying to, to count things in amongst people and things, right? Because you could just be looking at one part of something and then and blow it up or your own biases come into play. So I like to do this historically sometimes because you can see how far a distance you are from something like where things are now, but you can look back and be like, well, how were they then and how are they now? Things are clearly much worse than they were in 2015, you know, or even 2016 or even 2017, maybe. Like in 2017, there was more of a very militant, openly white supremacist right than there is now. But overall, I think things are much worse now than 2017. I mean, what 2016 showed us is how big an aggressive far right there is that otherwise holds ideological views that are part of the mainstream. But how many people are part of that and how willing they are to use force um, in an anti-democratic way that they don't no longer respect the institutions, the democratic institutions, right? Um, 
And so in that way, the actual threat by open white supremacists has sort of decreased. Um, it's, it's, it's back to maybe 2016 or something, 15, although they're more likely to use interpersonal violence and commit massacres, right? Like you don't really see massacres by Trumpists. You see stuff like Buffalo. Um, but there's such a huge growth of anti, anti-democratic, anti-leftist people on the far right of the Marjorie Taylor Greene, Paul Gosser style of people. And, and that's going to be a real danger because they have a much broader base to pull from. They're able to mobilize so many more people. Um, and they are committed to using force to overthrow you know, the political system and institute uh, an authoritarian right-wing government. They've shown that they're very willing to do this. And the constant and high level of support amongst Republicans for the people, for the action on one six and the people arrested show shows this. And this is a, 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 a incredible shift to the right for the Republican party, you know, even in any pre-Trump um, point, you know, like he, even in his original and his first campaign, it's, it's a huge shift to the right amongst the conservatives, conservatives in America. Of course, not all conservatives, Hashtag not all Republicans, but boy, but boy, a lot of them. It's a very interesting debate in the Democratic Party about, I don't know, for lack of a better term, and it's a bastardized term, and I agree with people who say that, but th this sort of wokeness debate sure. about are we going to lose the working class by saying Latinx or whatever? I, how do, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's overblown. I think, you know, the kind of like woke identity politics you're talking about tends to mobilize conservatives more than it tends to alienate, I guess you're talking about swing voters, right? Um, I don't think yeah. that the, do you know what I mean? I don't think too yes. many people in the, we talk about the working class first off, because yeah. even, I don't think you've intentionally done it, but, but you see it in your language kind of really meaning the white working class. Yes. Uh, Whereas in reality, yeah. especially because most people of color make less money, you know, a large yeah. part of the working class isn't white. Like more, more if the white people are 60% yeah. of the population, a yeah. greater number of them are, greater number of the working class aren't white. I don't think the Democrats are mo losing too many people by the woke language. I think that that stuff tends to motivate conservatives more than it tends to lose, say, swing voters or something, or, or lose committed Democrats. I think the, mo the worst thing you're talking about, the Midwest white working class, first off, deindustrialization de happened a long time ago. It's not like it just happened, and it happened mostly under a Republican. So I don't, I don't know that you're having so many like dispossessed people who just lost their jobs in factories, right? Like, that happened a long time ago. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm just saying like people like my mother, who's like yeah. a total liberal, always votes Democrat. She's, I don't think she's probably ever heard the term birthing people. Right. You know? Is your mother I, really going to start, but is your mother really going to vote for Trump because she heard the term yeah. people? No? I mean, so you yeah, roll, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you roll your eyes. People talk about yeah. this. My liberal friends talk about this. They're like, I hate, you know, all this stuff I hear, all this super woke stuff. Okay, well, some of it rubs me the wrong way too. But I'm like, yeah. does it really affect your life? That's like, true. you you have to be in some tiny little corner of the world, like in in like a very extremely liberal university department, or like in the most liberal nonprofit, for this stuff really to have almost yeah. any impact on your life, on your career, or on what you can do, almost yeah. anywhere else, it's something it's blown up in the media. I mean, okay. So like I have a, mm -hmm. I have a good friend. She's very liberal. She's a feminist. She's white. She's can't remember if she's like an older Gen X or a younger boomer. She complains about this stuff. She's not going to start voting Republican mm -hmm. because of this stuff. True. Like it's just, and I, and I'm like, come on, you know, Abby, we'll call her Abby. I'm like, Abby, does this affect your life in any way? And she's mm -hmm. like, well, no, and I'm like, yeah, I mean, come on. Like maybe at work you have a sensitivity training and they tell you mm -hmm. not to use racial slurs and not to put your hands on people or something everybody knows at this point in 2022. So I don't know. I don't think, again, I, I'm, I'm very, very dubious about any claim that this is actually losing votes for the Democrats. Uh, it is true that the Republicans campaign on this. 
but this helps, you know, some of political success is motivating your base to actually come and vote or to become politically active. That's why Clinton lost in 2016, because in the crucial states, the amount of Democrats that voted declined because people hated her. I didn't like her, and that's saying a lot. Um, whereas the Republican vote, the percentage of the people who usually vote Republican stayed the same for Trump, and the number declined for Clinton. Whereas with Biden, it increased again because people clearly were like, no, you know, not Trump. It also is about motivating people who don't normally vote. Like that, there's a huge amount of the population. Fifty it usually runs fifty percent, even in presidential elections, and and is much higher at lower level elections. So some of this is drawing in non-voters, traditional non-voters, or occasional voters. So again, like this kind of rhetoric, people say these things a lot, but is it really true? Like you need to look really closely. I think for sure it's overblown. And yeah. to what extent there's truth truth in it, I would be very careful to to actually see that quantified or to see yeah. in what situations it might be true. You know, you can say it across the board, but I don't know. If you had a Democrat yeah. running on a strong policy of helping things to help the working class, even a maybe, you know, not socially liberal white working class person, I think would be more likely to vote for a strong policy that was going to help them individually and not care about the little things about appealing to burden. Yeah or whatever. So I want to talk about this upcoming book uh, on James Mason, which I think is really fascinating. I don't really know uh, Metzger at all, or that sort of that generation. So tell me the figures that interest you most. Well, I'm really interested in, um, in national socialism in the United States, because the especially historically, there's been quite a difference between neo-Nazis and other, other kinds of white supremacists. And in fact, those um, that thing only came together in the late 70s, where like Klan and Nazi groups started working together. Um, and one of the books I'm supposed to write is a history of, of Nazism in America. So, uh, you know, one of the things I'm real interested in is the formation of the American Nazi Party uh, in the late 50s, because led by George Lincoln Rockwell, uh, that gave birth to an open neo-Nazi movement in the U.S. There had been Nazis before the war. There were two big groups. One was mostly a, a mostly German group called the Bund. They held the big rally at Madison Square Garden. You might have seen footage of in 1939. There was another American group, you know, native-born Americans called the Silver Shirts, led by a guy named William Dudley Pelly. All that stuff collapsed with World War II. All these fascist leaders were arrested in the um, under, I believe, the Smith Act. Uh, after the war, there was a big uh, period of time where you couldn't be an open neo-Nazi. I mean, you could be a Klan member. You know, the civil rights movement arose in the around 1954 is when it's considered generally to have started. And there's obviously a lot of Klan action. But you couldn't be a Nazi. There was a huge difference. And, you know, people saw the Klan rightly as opposing, you know, being against black people or, or hating black people wanting to keep segregation, whereas Nazis, especially at first, were really seen just as directed towards Jews. If you look at interviews from the 70s and stuff, they always talk to Jews. It's always the Jewish community that's really concerned because it hadn't quite come together as the one white supremacist movement as we know it now. But the American Nazi Party um, was very important because it, it opened that space where you could be an open neo-Nazi and use a swastika. Um, it wasn't very violent. It was actually quite unviolent compared to today, but then it fragmented in the 70s. Rockwell had been assassinated in 67. Uh, and he was taken over the the new leader called Kale, Matthias Kale. Nobody liked him. And so the party fragmented in the 70s. And this is the important thing because this sort of laid the groundwork for the neo-Nazi movement as we know it today. People like James Mason came out of it. Uh, the most famous one was William Pierce, who founded the National Alliance. He wrote the book, The Turner Diaries, which is a fiction book. Uh, illustrating a big race war. Um, it's, it's helped inspire the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995, which killed 168 people. But it's until siege has always been the the um, the main go-to if you wanted a, a book to inspire you to neo-Nazi terrorism. Um, there were a number of other groups that came out of this too. If uh, the, the group that did the Skokie incident did, uh, if you've ever seen the Blues Brothers movie where they run the Illinois Nazis off the bridge, yep. that's actually based on the, the Skokie incident. 
where this Nazi group wanted to march in a, a Jewish community, largely Jewish uh, suburb of Chicago that had a very high uh, number of Holocaust survivors there. It became a big national incident. So all these sort of groups in the 70s and into the 80s came out of the breakup of this party. And then there was another generation of Nazis, which included who weren't attached to the party. David Duke also was an early party member. Um, and Metzger was one of them who did not have a direct lineage with them. And then there was others too, like um, some of these were sort of semi-Nazis. Metzger was a purely a Nazi. Uh, Aryan Nations, some people might have heard of, people still use that name today. They made the compound in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. It's one reason there was all these white supremacists in Idaho. Um, and some other other groups like that, the Klan had another, the Klan and Nazis go in these revivals. They go in periods of going up and down. They're quite distinct with the Klan. They're called eras. So the one in the 1860s was the first era Klan. The one in the 1920s was the second era. If you ever see the pictures of the huge march in Washington or hear about the Klan, you know, supporting and being close to governors of states, that's the second era Klan, which collapses by the 40s. The third era is the one during the civil rights movement. That's extremely violent. That goes away after that. The fourth era is the one that David Duke is a big part of. It sort of splits. Duke was a, tried to mainstream white nationalism, and he wore a suit, you know, suit and tie and stuff. He had a college education, so he gave them a very, a different look. But there's also a more traditional wing. And then after that goes away, Duke leaves the Klan. Uh, it's it sort of there's other up and down waves of, of Klan activity. It, the Klan's almost gone now. People don't know this. There's like, I think, less than 25 groups as of the last SPLC census. Um, so in the 80s, again, there's another bulb of this activity in the 80s running through it, early mid 80s. Like the most one of the most infamous groups that comes out of this is called the Order People might have heard of them. They're like a true neo-Nazi, was Nazis and Klan members, terrorist group. They murdered a Denver talk show host in the 80s. And that kind of goes down in the mid-90s um, for the anti-fascist movement at, at, during that time to combat some of this stuff. And the Nazi skinheads who also come into the U.S. around that time, there was a, a, a network called Anti-Racist Action that was basically formed to combat Nazi skinheads within the punk rock scene. But that kind of goes away, or it didn't totally collapse. But as the Nazi skinhead thing collapses in the mid-90s, what happens is the militia movement sort of overtakes it as a really popular, aggressive thing on the far right, um, which runs through about 2000. ARA kind of folds, and then ARA essentially becomes, that movement or that milieu becomes quote, an, you know, Antifa, it was originally a split between groups who still were calling themselves ARA and groups that started to call themselves Antifa groups. They were sort of organizing differently. And that led into the, the anti-fascist movement, as we know it, on one hand. The other uh, white supremacist stuff had had basically collapsed. I mean, it's always been there. So it you know, goes down to a very low level around, around 2000. And so does the militia movement. And there's, I might have talked about this last time, there's not a lot of activity on the far right until Obama's election in 08. Um, the National Socialist Movement, also another group that has its origins in the American Nazi Party, becomes very popular then. That's the group Jeff, Jeff Scoop was in, who's now a, a, a supposed former. A lot of, you know, he he's not, he hasn't really gone through a process of, he has left the white supremacist movement, but he has not gone through a process of, um, of what you need to do to really leave it. He was one of the people sued in the Signs versus Kessler lawsuit after Charlotte's filling. I think, I think he has to pay like half a million dollars, but he still does the circuit talking about being a former extremist. Um, they became very popular at that period, as did, and that's when there was a whole wave of new groups like the Tea Party and the Oath Keepers Forum and stuff. And so from 2010 on, it just sort of increases. The alt right picks up out of this around 2015. Richard Spencer started being active around 2010, 2011 as a white nationalist. He had been a more moderate, on the more moderate part of the far right. And he becomes a white nationalist around then, and forms the, or joins, I think he joins the National Policy Institute. And then around 2015, the alt-right really picks up uh, by combining with um, the, the 4chan people who before had really, had been super misogynistic and were involved in the Gamergate scandal where they attacked these feminist uh, online game critics, but had not gone into to white supremacy yet. And they, they combine around 
2014-15, and that takes off into the alt-right as we know it. Who, who are the figures in this milieu throughout these decades that most are most interesting or sort of odd or mysterious in your in your view? Sure. I li- Rockwell's a really interesting guy. He was a um, he did advertising and he was an illustrator and he, he sold neo-Nazism like a product. You know, he designed these really clever flyers and stuff because he was a graphic designer. Um, his publications are, are are nicely done. He knew how to outrage people almost like he was going to sell. You know, it was like he was selling a product and he knew how to word things and use slogans and use images. And he was very successful in a way. I mean, he wasn't at the time it was a small group, but he was successful in implanting this idea that there could be a neo-Nazi movement. So. I've always been admired as perhaps perhaps the wrong tint, but you know, he was, he was, uh, um, what he did was, was very clever. Tom Metzger, as I've talked about with you a lot, um, is also a really interesting character. He was more of a mainstream far rightist. He was like in the John Birch society and he moved further and further to the right. Um, he had had a very successful run for, um, uh, 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 in the Democratic Party, he won a primary for, I forget what, what exactly it was now, I think it might have been Congress or something, um, and got tens of thousands of votes. But he, in, in a number of steps, decided like you couldn't work through the system and became you know, a revolutionary white supremacist. But he was quite a smart guy. He adopted a lot of left-wing theory. He courted the Nazi skinhead movement very early on before it exploded. And that sort of gave him a base. If you read his newspaper, it's not stupid, though. It's actually, um, you know, it's well written and they have ideas behind it. Partly, I think we talked about this in the previous part of the interview, recruited some former leftists. So uh, Metzger recruited two former leftists who worked on his newspaper. One of them, um, Wyatt Kaldenberg, was a former Trotskyist. uh, And the other... uh, John or Gary, he used both names, Jewel, had been a actually um, a leading member in the, the IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, this anarchist-style labor union. Um, and uh, Jewel wrote all these articles for him, and Kaldenberg ran his newspaper, and James Mason also wrote for him. So there was a kind of intellectual sophistication um, along with this, and then they ran these super crude um uh, uh, anti-Semitic and uh, anti-Black racist cartoons, right? And so they're both things are going on at once. And the guy who wrote ma- did many of these cartoons, Nick Bugis, uh, was the guy who did the, the happy merchant image that the alt-right loves of this hook-nosed Jew. If people have ever seen alt-right stuff, you've seen this image. And that was actually one of his, Bugis's old images. Um, so all this different stuff is going on. Metzger even sort of changes his line. He's not always what you would think he would be. He, you know, says things like, um, you know, the real problem here is global capital and the people running this aren't, you know, only a few of them are Jews. Like the people running global capitalism, which is destroying, you know, our nations, our pure, racially pure nations are, um, you know, white Christians. And we should all, he was a third positionist, He had meetings with the Nation of Islam and the new Black Panther Party. He was trying to create a coalition of racial separatists and appeal to leftists to try to, like, take the system down. James Mason had a similar view, too. He wasn't a third positionist, but he was very close, where he was like, anything that uh, attacks the system is good. Uh, He didn't exactly want an alliance with leftists. He was hoping that leftists would start a civil war with the federal state and they'd fight it out. And then a bunch of the leftists and the federal government would be weakened. And then the Nazis and the white supremacists could kind of, who had been hanging back, could then step into the fray and try to like take over or or win an area of the country. Um, Metzger had, had endorsed directly the, um, what was called the Pacific Northwest Territorial Imperative, this idea that um, which is very popular in the 80s into the 90s. And some people still endorse that you could break off the northwest part of the country, usually like Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, um, because that area is over, it's one of the widest or one of the widest areas of the country. And you could break that off and have a separate white state. 
some people have even said you don't need to expel people of color since it's it's so white if you just like cut the borders there like people of color can stay because it will be de facto a white state um like portland oregon it's extremely liberal and also the, the the whitest city in the united states um so Metzger was all into these unusual ideas, and he was a sort of savvy operator for someone who had such extreme politics. Um, he knew in general how to advocate for violence without getting in trouble, although he finally did in 1988 when some of his – a local Nazi skinhead gang that had just met with one of his recruiters killed an Ethiopian immigrant called Mulugeta Sarah in Portland, Oregon. This led to him being sued by the Southern Poverty Law Center. And they used an innovative commercial lawsuit to bankrupt him. After which he then started espousing lone wolf, uh, lone wolf attacks and leaderless resistance, which again sort of put him ahead of the curve. Um, so he was pretty consistently ahead of the curve on stuff and, and very savvy, savvy and a, a bit unusual in the moves that he made. I heard you say that Metzger was a Democrat. Um, he ran as a Democrat. Or he was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he ran as a Democrat. But a lot no, of white supremacists ran as Democrats until they switched to being Republicans. Okay. That was fairly See, typical. Yeah, yeah. But did he, did, were you able to go back and look at his speeches? Was he hiding the radical stuff at that point? Uh, he had been a Klan leader. So, oh. I mean, this was obvious to people. There was a moment in which certain white supremacists did exceedingly well in elections around I think 78 and 80, the 1980 election, especially that's when Reagan was elected by a significant so, majority. And so it was some of these races, they got like 40% in statewide races. Um, Harold Covington, who gained some notoriety during the, the, the period of the alt-right before he died, ran for attorney general in North Carolina and got like 40% of the vote. It was very well known he was a Nazi. He was actually in that same group that did the Skokie incident that the Blues Brothers thing is based on. Uh, everybody doesn't know this story. The, the guy who led that group, Frank Collin, yeah. lost his leadership when he was both, he was outed as being, a, his dad had been, it was Jewish and had been in a concentration camp. And he kidding? was a pederast and had, not just was having sex with young boys, but he took pictures of this. He did it in their headquarters and he kept the pictures in his desk because his subordinates, including Harold Covington, went and found them and turned them into the cops. And that's mm. how Covington became the next leader. And then I looked him up and did he like go to prison and then like come out and like start doing like uh, black history lectures? He started writing like UFO books and stuff under a, a pseudonym. Okay, I saw a lecture where he was like, yeah, all the Greek math was really African. <laughs> Okay. So some of these guys are very strange. Uh, uh, Asa Winstanley, I believe is oh, his yeah. name, was this. Uh, he was in a, a crypto Nazi group called the National States Rights Party and was a, a Klan, a Klan guy who's actually the speechwriter for George Wallace, the segregationist uh, politician. And he wrote this famous book that's supposed to be by a Native American. Um, yeah, that like won awards and stuff, and people only realized later it was written by this white supremacist. So yeah, there's a PBS on it, the a PBS like American Experience on it. You had a legislature down there, three fourths colored. They voted by sticking their feet in the air. Here's the education of Little Tree, promoting peace, stability, and the spiritual ways of the Cherokee. <laughs> Turns out Forrest Carter doesn't really exist. This is Asa Carter, a man who's one of the most notorious racists in the state of Alabama. It's called, it's called like the education, isn't it like the education of little toe or something? Something like that, I think. I'm very curious to ask you this. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to understand the far right media ecosystem before the year 2000 or like 1996. My this is my understanding from is that the sort of central, you know how they would say like National Review was like the house uh, magazine of conservatism, right? Sure. It seems to me based on what I've heard that the spotlight 
mm-hmm. produced by uh, Willis Cardo yep. and uh, the Liberty Lobby, was sort of the National Review for this far-right sort of quasi-Nazi or open Nazi fringe. Is that correct? Sort of. Uh, it was a newspaper. So Cardo, I give this little history, he was um, f- far more popular. He ran all these projects, but he was sort of softer. He really kind of was a Nazi, like a national socialist, but he was much softer in the presentation. He was, say, he was a populist. Um, but it was very racist and anti-Semitic beneath uh, the gist of you just barely scratched the surface. The spotlight did have a huge circulation. Uh, I think at one point it reached like, over a hundred thousand, which is crazy for a, a, a neo-Nazi paper. Um, but it wasn't like, because it wasn't a magazine. This is the thing. The national review is like a magazine that different voices can debate in. And that's not what the spotlight was. That was Cardo's project. And Cardo was a real sleazeball. And so all these people worked with him and burned out within a few years. You know, he eventually like lost control to his subordinates who sued him. Um, he One of the projects was the Institute for Historical Review, which was the main place to disseminate uh, Holocaust denial in the United States, uh, and had a, a pseudo-academic journal, um, the Journal of Historical Review, and he lost control of it in a lawsuit in a bankrupted spotlight, which had to be reinvented by his subordinates um, as the American Free Press, which still exists today as a print newspaper. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't quite, there was never a central organ and almost all of them were the organs of, of groups of specific, you know, groups. And so that it wasn't national review as a platform, a general platform for, for conservative thought. And that's the difference. But, but it was sort of the big dog, right? It was the biggest, it was certainly the biggest uh, publication that was a, a, a white supremacist publication, even though they did take some um, pains to make sure it didn't look like that exactly. Related question, have you ever, and I I came across this like almost by accident years ago, but I was able to download their entire archive and it's very interesting. Have you ever heard of this magazine called Insaturation? Mm Mm-hmm, yeah. um, Wilmot run it. Robertson. Uh, yeah, yeah right. he was one of the main – he wrote a book about the white ethno state that was very influential. He's not very well known, but that was a pretty sophisticated um, white supremacist magazine. I've, I've seen little bits of issues. Um, he's much more – you know, they don't produce a lot of intellectuals. Like, you know, if you're in Marxist circles and you swing a cat, you're going to hit 32, you know, academics. Um, white supremacists in the United States have not produced – these kinds of thinkers and uh, Wilmot was a uh, smarter than your average bear in those circles, but he hasn't received much attention and, and I haven't really read through his stuff either, partly because it's unclear how influential he was, right? Exactly. It's sort of yeah. like James Mason. No one paid any attention to him. Um, so I'm looking at all these books that, that, that cover the seventies and eighties. He's barely mentioned in them. I think there's, you know, the most he gets is like in one book, like, three lines, you know, and where he is mentioned is just because he's provided archival materials to researchers, you know, and now he's a big deal. So people don't pay attention to, no matter how interesting little figures are, they generally aren't paid attention to. It's when you become influential that you, like he is now, that that people move towards, towards somebody to document them and understand them. I mean, rightfully so, you know, like there's a zillion people you could write about, mm-hmm. but what's the hook to write about them? Um, also, there's just not very much scholarly work on the white supremacist movement. I mean, people, really, uh, it's it, there's a, comparatively little. Even major groups, there's maybe mm. one. Like Metzger, there's one kind of journalist journalistic account about. There's no book about the Aryan nations. Um, wow. You know, if there is one book, a case. There's only two books about George Lincoln Rockwell, despite his like really massive influence. Like. Mm. It's very underdocumented That's um, stuff. Even now, there's not a lot of good documentation about the alt right. Like, if you really want to know about the figures and their relationship and their politics, wow. like, I mean, there's some studies. There's a lot of studies about you know data and and stuff and irony or or whatever in it. But if you're talking about actual studies of political actors, there's extremely little. 
I assume you've read Kathleen uh, Ballou's book, uh, Bring, Bringing, what was it? Bring, Bring the War Home. Did you, you know, I didn't, I didn't read it. I, um, I don't agree with her approach. It's funny. I, I gave a talk at Rutgers University um, right after Charlottesville, and she happened to give a, a talk too, right in the same room, right before mine. And I, I, it wasn't, it wasn't how I saw the history. So I, I actually didn't, actually didn't read it. What are the differences? I, I don't agree with her. Um, the one thing that I remember standing out was I don't agree her account of her account about the Klan, how Klan and Nazi groups started to work together. It's called the Nazification of the Klan. And I remember I asked her, I was like, I'm confused. Are you talking about the Nazification of the Klan? And she was like, I hate that term. Um, I don't know. It just didn't, you know, some historians, the way they are just like anybody, like any writer, you know, you read different yeah. political writers and, and some of them think more like you and some of them don't. I was thinking about this on Twitter, you know, um, I'm very active on Twitter. If you want to follow me at transform six, seven, eight, nine, um, you know, certain people, and I do this with others too. I pay closer attention to certain people and less attention to others, even if they're kind of talking about the same thing. And it's not even how interesting they are. It's just, got, I'm, I'm, we see, we analyze things more closely or you have interests that are closer to mine and talk about them in a way that I'm interested in and others. And it's not even that, like, it's not even a diss to them. They just look at it differently in a way that you're not so interested in, or they cover different topics. So just so I can understand a little bit better, is it sort of her framing of, and this is her argument is much more complex than this, but the Vietnam war is like super central to her Mm -hmm. idea of what brought about these groups. Are you skeptical of that? You know, I don't know. It's been a long time since, yeah, since sure. I really explored her stuff. For There's sure. different things she says. I can tell you, like she, she'll she say as a pundit, you know, oh, we should call it the white power movement. And I don't understand that. That was like a, a phrase popularized by Rockwell that was, that was used mostly in the 80s and 90s. And now other phrases are being used. I don't understand why what, she, what would you call, we should it? call it that. I finally, you know, there's there's no term for a movement. Um, I finally just broke down and call it the white supremacist movement. Um, I used to call it white nationalism as a as an umbrella term, but that has again that was sort of invented to soften it, and I think it's it has come to to mean the softer versions of it again. Um, I didn't like the term white supremacist partly because I'm very interested in white separatists and how they behave differently. But I do think, but often for many people, white separatists, they're just trying to, again, use, they're not really committed to separatism. They're just trying to, it's yeah. an angle and they'll take it. Um, and I, I still do think like, you're not a separatist uh, because you like <laughs> people of other identities. You're a separatist because you look down on them, you know, at the end of the day. Uh-huh. So I use that. I mean, one yeah. could use a term like racialist, which I think actually might be better where you're thinking about race first, you're a white racialist, and that would cover a lot of stuff. But again, I think to use it as a popular term is a weasel out, Mm -hmm. you know, and I don't want to give them a weasel out. Yeah. But something like that might be more, might get at something a little more accurate. Then it could be like the people soft selling it in Congress and the people ranting about Zog and the separatists who want alliance with black separatists. Um, but a lot of this stuff, again, is like how, how these terms are all have political implications yeah. and, and you, you want to nail people and not let them not let them squirm away because these people love to squirm away. Yeah, I want to I want to get into terminology in a second. The reason I brought up Baloo is there there's this amazing passage in her book because Lewis Beam, this Vietnam guy, and he be, I think he was a big clan guy, and then mm-hmm. he ended up at Aryan Nations and mm-hmm. all that. Yeah, he had actually been in Duke's uh, clan group as well, one of yeah. the many people. But there's this amazing passage in uh, Baloo's book that was so amazing, I, like, snipped it out just so mm-hmm. I could send it to people because it was almost comical. Beam set out to form his own group. He began with sporadic violent activity all of it anti-communist or white supremacist. He was arrested for disrupting a communist protest, dynamiting a Houston radio station that broadcast what he called Hanoi News, 
and blowing up the local Communist Party headquarters. In each case, charges against him were dropped or never filed. <laughs> and I was like, and there was no follow-up on, okay, well, that sounds like a federal informant or something, but there, there was no investigation of that in the book. Now, obviously, the FBI and informants or whatever the right terminology have played a, a role, but w mm -hmm. what... Can you separate fact from fiction about how much of these neo-Nazi groups were run or infiltrated by the FBI? Well, they're, they're completely infiltrated. This was part of the rise of leaderless resistance is that they were, had this top-down organizing structure. They often, you know, where you joined an organization, they had membership cards, you paid dues and subscribed to the newspaper. All right, well, if you infiltrate that group, you have all that information already, right? You got the membership roles and the, the address from the newspaper subscription and everything. Part of this and part of this infiltration to combat it was the strategy of leaderless resistance. Very explicitly, Mech, Metzger's case, although Beam also was clued into this a little earlier on. Um, some of the people probably are FBI agents. Was Covington? Well, I don't know. Um, uh, but uh, others ha have been very clearly in there, or it's cl it should have been clear that they were confidential agents or they had turned and testified. This is fairly common. And for some reason, white supremacists will let these people back into the fold. I mean, the guy in um, uh, in Adam Waffen, who Sutter. was publishing, yeah, Sutter. Sutter was known to have been an informant in the past. He had been arrested, and he had been known to be an informant. And they, this was public knowledge. I knew this, and he was allowed in Adam Waffen. I mean, talk about Fox in the Hen House. Um, so yeah, Hal Turner, who um, became arrested again, was known as an informant, and then he became arrested for threatening a judge. I mean, some of these people are really wild, and you're, they'll play both sides of the fence, and you're never quite sure what side they're on. But this behavior, uh, maybe I don't know, this behavior is tolerated by them. Um, it's funny, on the left, if you've testified against somebody, you are out, like snitches are not, are, are just like not allowed to be around at all. So I, I don't, I don't quite understand the mentality. Maybe people are just have such a wild mentality in these and the, these far right wing circles that it's just more of the same, you know. But um, I'm, they're always killing each other, killing other people, killing each other, committing suicide, killing their families, you know. Maybe in just such a, a volatile atmosphere, this just is another thing. What do you think about the efficacy of debating these sort of far right conspiracy theories? You know, for instance, the idea that the 1965 Immigration Act was some sort of Jewish plot. Is it at all worthwhile to explain the actual history of? Actually, it was led by Ted Kennedy, who thought it would bring in more of his Irish cousins or and to go through the different points, or is that just a total waste of time? Yes. Oh, it is. Okay. <laughs> really? I mean, you can do some. You can blunt the edge of it, you know, but so this is a conspiracy theory, and you can't talk conspiracy theorists out of their conspiracies. Have you ever tried to do this? Not really. It doesn't work because they the basis of their belief. So to put this, uh, and it's not a bad, it's not, you should have some level of counter propaganda, but it's mostly for people who are like, oh, I heard this and is it true? You know what I mean? Those people you can, you can knock into rationality. Um, but for people who believe in conspiracies, they don't care about the fact. This is just like, a front for their belief. And if it wasn't the 1965 act, it would be a new thing because, you know, I'd never heard of that before a few years ago and they'll just grab onto something else. They'll just say it's the Jews doing it through the synagogues or something. Do you know what I mean? Like you can't, you can't think about their arguments for the most part. There's a few exceptions, but you can't think about their arguments as a kind of actual analysis that can be disproven. That's not what's going on. They're looking for some kernel of truth to hang their their wild emotional appeal on. 
So you're never I, gonna fa- you're never gonna fact check a conspiracy theorist away. Look at all look at all the Trumpist stuff. People can fat people fact check oh the Q Trump enough. as much as they wanted. When Hitler when he was you know he didn't come to power he was active in Germany for I think it's like 1919. So you know a good like 14 years or or whatever the exact amount was. He he was criticized all over the place in the newspapers and his ideas were debunked. There was no shortage of information explaining why what he was saying wasn't true. It's an emotional appeal that they're using. Do you know what I mean? And so yeah. rationally, analytically, factually challenging it isn't really challenging the core of its appeal to people. Have you ever looked at Eustace Mullen's FBI file? <laughs> no, I haven't. Oh, you you should. It's wild. Is that all these rumors was, about him being gay? Oh, no, not rumor. He, I, apparently he was, and I don't care about this, and that's not why I brought it up. He was arrested, though, apparently, in, um, I think, New York for sodomy with a guy with a very Jewish last name in, like, <laughs> 1952, which is classic. But he got his start making up a fake speech of a rabbi who never existed in Budapest. Mm-hmm. That was like he's like, well, we've got the the speech. Right here Should it is. And it was the just, protocols. I thought that was supposed to be. No, no, it was a different. It was. Yeah. It was a different <laughs> meeting. Same time, yeah. different meeting. Yeah, yeah. Um. So I mean, but this is what Holocaust yeah. denial is. Exactly. Know? It's just all fabricated. One of yeah. the one of the best things I saw. This is what you're saying. Why don't we put out books about the reality of the 1965 Act? Is that one of the people who does works work about Holocaust deniers, they were like, because some of them actually go through archives and stuff and find materials. This is how David Irving became famous. He had access to, he was a good archive researcher, but someone went through, not I think not his, but someone else's work in the same archive. And they're like, we can see, he pulled these documents out, but he purposely skipped over the ones that mm. had counter information. And so mm. we know that they know what's going on and they're just mining. You know, they're not just deluded because they heard wrong things and they didn't get facts. Like they know exactly what's going on here because because in the very same archive they cite, they don't cite the, the evidence to the contrary. Have you noticed that, and I feel like I've seen this, and I mentioned Michael Collins Piper, who was, I don't, how would you classify him? He's just an extremely anti-Semitic, writer for the uh, Spotlight and then American right. Free Press. He, he was part of Willis Cardo's circle yeah. of people. And it's really funny, like, Cardo trained people because you still see people running around who came out of the Cardo network. You, do you know Matthew Raphael Johnson, that guy? No. He's Just one like of another the, one. No, he's sort of interesting. He's like a... He was like a professor. He's like a... Orthodox. Uh, he's he reads Russian. He actually taught. They found him at Charlottesville. He was there at Charlottesville, <laughs> and so. Uh, but he he has like a PhD, I think. But yeah. he wrote for American Free Press, and he's like a huge Putin guy. Putin biologist, yeah. But but uh, Michael Collins Piper, I heard that he had like a, not an adopted son, but he he was like a mentor to a black kid or something. Or and one thing I feel like I've noticed with these deep anti semites is that they sometimes lighten up in their racism. Have you noticed that? There are anti semites who are not racist, or it's just really not as important. There are sort of, I call them pure anti-Semites, and they will work with anybody. Like, they're not interested in questions of race. And sometimes they want a multiracial um, kind of um, anti-Semitism, right? Uh, they All anti-Semites aren't white supremacists. Almost all white supremacists are anti-Semites, at least in the modern age. Like, the Klan only started getting anti-Semitic during the civil rights movement. The segregationist movement wasn't necessarily anti-Semitic. It was during its anti-civil rights period that it became more anti-Semitic. We're just really used to this time where the two go together. Um, You know, like American colonialism and slavery, you know, and genocide against Native Americans, not driven by (laughs) anti-Semitism. It just wasn't. 
Um, not that there wasn't anti-Semitism running around, but this wasn't like the theory behind it in the way that it is the theory behind groups now. So you will get anti-Semites who are just not so interested in the white nationalism or or it's very secondary or they're happy to work with black anti-Semites. Um, there was someone out of Cardo's network that spoke here in New York at a left-wing space, Christopher Bolin. And he had the guy, he was a white supremacist, but the guy who... who who I think spoke before him or was working with him was a black anti-Semite um, who was also, this was all pseudo 9-11. It was 9-11 truth stuff, but it was this anti-Semitic version of 9-11 truth. So yeah, um, for sure that happens. And then you get black anti-Semites. They're, they're not white supremacists. Some of them will work with them, but um, you know, and they're often black nationalists or many, a chunk of black nationalists are anti-Semites, but you don't even have to be. You can be a black anti-Semite, not even be a black nationalist. I, but it's fun. I, I, I can have, tell you in, in yeah. Brooklyn how many times I've heard from black cab drivers and, and sometimes <laughs> who, who I interact with on the street about how the Jews own all the, you know, the Jews are the blood-sucking parasite landlords. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard that. Yeah. Let's talk about anti-Semitism. One of the things I think happens is these guys get to a point where they're like anti-immigration, anti-gay, and they start saying it's the globalist. It's mm -hmm. it's the left. Well, they but need an then, ex explanatory mechanism. Exactly. It's just too amorphous. It's too complex. It's like, ugh. But then they, they find the anti-Semitic narrative, and it's just sort of clarifying to them. Mm -hmm. Is that essentially, do you think that's one of the central uh, polls? Oh, yeah, for sure. I wrote an essay right after Charlottesville called The Three Pillars of the Alt-Right. And it was, you know, white supremacy, misogyny, and anti-Semitism. But um, anti-Semitism is their theory, basically, uh, especially as you get into real white supremacy. And again, this is today, you know, in the post-war period, post-60s era. I mean, that's, it's that conspiracy that makes everything run. Otherwise, you just have these like, you know, immigrants are coming in. Well, who's causing the immigrants to come in? Um, and if they don't talk about the Jews, usually they talk about a, a washed out or, or secularized version of anti-Semitism, right? Where like the globalists or the insiders is what the John Birch Society calls them. And if you look back, as you know, if you trace the genealogy of this idea, it's almost always some kind of like anti-Semitic idea that's been uh, filtered to make it more acceptable. So, you know, and then if you start digging through through this literature that you have, so you, you get interested in these ideas and you start digging, you will hit the anti-Semitic stuff. It's just circulating, circulating around, you know? And it is more open and has, I think, to some extent has more rigor than some of the other things because people have worked on these anti-Semitic narratives for so long that just like come up a lot, come up with a lot of ways to talk about it. In a way that sometimes I think if you ask Trump about the globalists, you're not going to get a very profound answer. Another thing I've long thought about these neo-Nazis is that for them, Hitler and neo-Nazism, it's sort of like a fly in the light. If you, I mean, if you were to take a rational look at it, like, okay, maybe I'm privately, that is not me, but somebody, take somebody like one of these far-right Gen Z siege type kids today. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I'm privately, I'm like a Nazi, but I want to build, and I want to build a movement to stop immigration or whatever. And so a rational approach would probably be like, okay, so maybe I don't want to brand my entire movement around gas chambers, Auschwitz, mm -hmm. Nazism, Hitler, but they like can't resist Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> what do you look, think? This, this is Patriot Front, is it not? Where they don't. I use, guess that. I guess you're right. I guess you're right. But that publicly, but once you get inside, and oh. not everyone's a Nazi inside of it, but they're pretty openly Nazi inside of it. One of Cardo's early groups was like this Youth for Wallace. He um, used it to try. It wasn't an official group for George Wallace's campaign. The, the segregationist who ran in um, '68 and '72 trying to get up that energy. And so uh, 
a lot of people were like, oh yeah, Wallace, I like Wallace and we need like a youth oriented aggressive group. But then once they went to private parties, people were Nazis. So everyone in the group wasn't Nazis. And then the others were like, whoa, okay, too much for me. Um, so uh, David Duke did that same change that you were talking about, except he did resist the Nazi thing. He originally started as an open neo-Nazi. He was in the original National Socialist Liberation Front. But after a few years, like realized this wasn't how you were going to get a big following, right? It was just too toxic to most people. And so he kept watering stuff down until he hit this sort of clan light view and then formed the National Association for the Advancement of White People and then ran as a, um, uh, you know, ran for office. Um, I think he was a Republican. He was one of the first of these kinds of people to run as a Republican and not a Democrat because the segregationists had all been Democrats, you know. Um, but yeah, some people can't resist. It's just where they're at ideologically. It's like some people, they just want to be a communist. Like they could be a liberal Democrat, but they're like, that's just not where I'm at. You know what I mean? Um, and then so, other people are like, yeah, I agree with you, but we need the soft sell because you're not going to get anywhere. You know, do you want to be a little ideological leader like Tom Metzger, or like a smart guy? who has his little niche, but he's never going to have real influence and power. If that's that's satisfying to you personally, then maybe you can do that. Um, but if you want to exercise real power, you probably got to move towards the center. And you probably can't have be tainted with this background if you're going to continue to be in pretty far-right politics, right? That's where you get the real problems. You could move to the center and be like, oh, I was young and blah, blah, blah. But um, if you stay on the far right and you used to be a Nazi, that can really taint you. You know, one of the things I neglected to mention, and that's my fault, was you were there at Charlottesville. Somebody uh, doxed the, one of the few women that were marching with the Nazis at Charlottesville. And uh, I looked her up and I saw she, she was like doing these interviews on these like sort of normie conservative shows or whatever. And she said, uh, oh, I didn't even know there was somebody with a Nazi banner. And, oh, it was just like one second, a guy. Now, is that all? <laughs> I, I'm assuming it's all bullshit, but all it bullshit. is, right? They're just, those people are such liars. Um, in the book I'm working on about James Mason, I have whole sections about, there were three kind of influential cultural figures from the 80s and 90s, Boyd Rice, Adam Parfrey, and... Um, Michael Moynihan, and there's a whole section for each of them about all of the lies they told, how they lied about their period of neo-Nazi involvement, breaking it down, because they've had so many different lies. So this is a totally typical thing. James Mason stands out very clearly because he's never done this. He's always said, yes, I'm a neo-Nazi. All these other people, they always try to hide it. They have no sense of honor. Um, and no sense of truthfulness about their own movement and standing up for their views. And it's again, like the, um, like the informants and stuff, it's totally accepted uh, to do that. They won't flinch, you know, they, I think they might even be encouraged, you know, because they, everybody does it and they do it so often. So, you know, 0% surprise and they're liars, you know, they just make stuff up. There's all these conspiracy theories. So they have no problem making up outlandish lies and, you know, being like, oh, I had no idea. <laughs> like, how did you not have any idea? That's ridiculous. I mean, just go home. So I wrote a little list of who I put in my most dangerous sector of, like, these are the most dangerous people, okay? Nick Fuentes, the GDL, National Socialist Movement, Patriot Front, the Adam Waffen people, or the TRS, Mike Enoch people. So that's who I... I don't even put Trump in that list. Tucker's honestly. not on your list? Oh, he should probably be there, too. Yeah. But who do you put, who do you think are, like, up in that upper sector? You know, I think more people like Green and Gosser and their connections with Fuentes. Some oh, of those yeah, groups yeah, are, are, little, are little sectarian groups that are never going to get a lot of traction, like Goyam Defense League. I mean, if they're in your town, they're also, they're kind of like, you see these pictures from they're big guys. Um, you know, I, I think the Proud Boys are a much bigger problem than GDL. Um, you know, even Patriot Front, I don't know. It almost seems like a honeypot. Like, it's like a, 
it's like in the old days, you had these Trotskyist organizations and they'd sell papers and they'd recruit students to sell papers and they to recruit students to sell papers. So that's what <laughs> that's what Patriot Front is doing. Um, you know, and some of those are are disbanded. Even Adam Waffen's disbanded. Yeah. Um, and the things that have come out of it don't have the reach that Adam Waffen did. It had like eighty people with like almost two dozen chapters. But I think it's it's definitely this right wing of Congress in alliance, you know, surfing the big QAnon pool with people like Tucker, I think has the biggest reach, who's a true, like solid far right person. Um, and they're just, you know, pressing the button over and over again because they're tied to this grassroots base. Um, I think the white supremacists, um, are always a problem, but they're not going to be able to exercise real national level power. They'll go around and murder people and they'll make sure that these narratives, these hard narratives keep circulating, but the ones who are going to put them into action are, are people who are, and you're, you're totally right. Like Trump's fairly moderate compared to some of the people now. It's actually kind of scary who are, who are, you know, in the government now. Um, but it's those people who are going to, be the ones, you know, in alliance with the Christian right who have a real shot at, you know, uh, taking apart a democratic system and taking apart civil rights that people have. Um, it's not it's not going to be the Goyam Defense League that does that. I want to ask you about terms, because here's what you need to do to qualify as a neo-Nazi in my eyes. Mm -hmm. If you're posting in private, if you're posting like memes glorifying the Holocaust mm -hmm. or, and, and Hitler, you're a neo-Nazi, in my view. Mm -hmm. Is that? Do you think so too? Well, it depends how you want to do it. It, it. That's generally what people consider. If you're a white supremacist and you use Nazi symbols and slogans and stuff, you'll be considered a Nazi. But but that doesn't mean you really are an ideological national socialist. Like people call Richard Spencer a neo-Nazi, and they go, "Oh, we have the hail victory thing." And yeah, that's, all fair. that's all fair, but like you talk to him, he's like, oh yeah, the neo-Nazis don't like me, like, you know, and there is a really, you read his stuff, quite a difference between him and say Andrew Anglin or something. Um, so, I mean, whatever. I mean, I don't yeah. know yeah. how much, but, but that is pretty typical what you're, and I do it too a little bit, like Metzger is not truly a neo-Nazi, although he had strong and open neo-Nazi elements. He's like, oh, I side with the Strasser brothers, the left wing of the Nazi party, um, and would use swastikas and stuff. But he wasn't really a neo-Nazi. And there's interviews where like, he interviewed Carl Hand, who James Mason used to work with. And, and Metzger's genuinely interested. He's like, what does a, a, a true national socialist like think about X? And, and Metzger so you really would like, doesn't know. There's this fine line when we have like discussions about when we're talking about like de radicalization. When we talk about like these Gen Z neo Nazis and like what is causing this and how can we prevent it, the difficulty I find, and I wrote these questions, is like, is how do we discuss this without justifying? Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I think we talked about this before. Like, first off, you have to look at what they're actually doing. I mean, it's easy to say, well, they feel X because of Y, but is that really true? Or is that just some nonsense they're saying? You know what I mean? And people come to political movements from all kinds of different directions. Like, that is always the case, right? So it's not going to be one place they're coming to. Um, but I don't know. Like, again, um, you have to recognize what what people are feeling, what psychological or practical need is being filled by a political movement, and you have to analyze that. So first you have to understand it, you know, and then you have to analyze it. That's it. Let me put it this way. I heard that there was like some research, and this could be all bunk, that they like did, were studying diversity workshop things and, mm -hmm. in work work environments. Mm -hmm. And there was some suggestion, I think from one study, that it actually like, it, it actually effect. made some of them more racist. Is, do you think that's, there's anything there? Could we like, could we be making some like tragic mistake in that way or? I think that the, the, I'll say, I mean, I don't think the left, 
does a good job of showing in terms of race what it is that it wants people to move towards. Is the failure to this making people more racist? I don't know. I mean, I feel like people are always going to come up with some dumbass excuse to, for their bigotry. Um, and I, I also don't believe that no one's, and people are going from like being whatever not racist could possibly mean, being a moderate about these issues to having some training that rubs them the wrong way and suddenly becoming racists. You know, that's just, that's not how people think about stuff. Um, they might think, well, that was an annoying training, but they're not like, oh, hey, I need to be a racist now. <laughs> you know, um, I don't think the left um, is very good about showing what it, it wants its future to be. Um, but the civil rights movement, I thought was very good about that. And I'm not sure it, you know, it, it, it made white people less racist or made those who were committed to racism change either. I mean, so I don't know what you're, you're exactly how to answer this. No, that, that was I, a good I think answer. Certainly, I think certainly the left could do better about this. It needs to show, needs to do two things. It needs to show what a multiracial, a workable multiracial future is going to look like, because it often doesn't in a way that incorporates white people. It's, it's very bad about this. Um, and the second thing is, is you got to realize that some people are always going to be very socially conservative mm -hmm. and the left needs to almost create a place to put them where they can be depoliticized and be like, it's not true. Like be like, you're, we're not going to mess with your cultural practices as long as they're not mm -hmm. hurting mm -hmm. other people. Mm -hmm. Like can't have all the money and keep all the money or something or impose your views on others. But like, you want to go to church and like, I don't know, only marry other white people and, you know, yeah. whatever it is, you want to listen to Pat mm -hmm. Boone records, like mm -hmm. you can do that. We're mm -hmm. not going to stop you from doing that and, and sort of, but try to, I think people like that get politicized. Like people don't realize that Protestant Christians weren't this, it wasn't this right wing base until like the seventies. They were actually, I think with the Democrats, cause they, didn't have they you know on an economic level you know did believe in redistribution of wealth and it, it changed at a certain time that these things got politicized so we need to get make avenues to depoliticize socially conservative people in a sense or culturally conservative people so that they don't feel um, that their practices their quote traditional American practices are threatened do you know what I mean and yeah, I know, left yeah. absolutely does not do a good job of that. That for sure yeah. does not do a good job of. I'm really excited for this James Mason thing you're working on. Can you just tell us about that a little more? Sure. So I've been writing this book about James Mason. He wrote a book called Siege. So it's a book about a book. It's the it's a, a the most popular book amongst young aspiring neo-Nazi terrorists. Um, it holds that you can't work through the system to make change, to be a white supremacist and do that. You have to overthrow the system and you should do that either by dropping out or by committing acts of terrorism um, that will help spur on this process. He was a um, friend of uh, Charles Manson's and also at the time, this is sort of not so important now, was like Manson needs to be the new neo-Nazi leader. Hitler's dead, Rockwell's dead. Um, now Charles Manson should be the leader. Uh, so the book is about how he came to these ideas, which was through a series of, of smaller and smaller neo-Nazi groups that he went through as they kept fighting with each other and splitting. And he, he went like through a funnel until finally it was just him. And he became more radical in the process. And then the other half is about how a group of um, right-wing, um, but proto-alt-right, and sometimes very specifically, you can see the line right to the alt right, uh, right wing counterculturalists discovered his works. His works are very obscure. The magazine, the, he was self publishing a newspaper. He literally cranked it out on his own press. It had like a distribution of less than 75. They, they discovered him and they um, turned his newsletters into a book, uh, promoted him in their own circles, even in books that are still in print, a famous book called like Apocalypse Culture you can still buy through Feral House Press and The Manson File, another book that's continually been reprinted, um, sort of sold him, wanted to sell him to the counterculture. He was very happy for this. And this is how the book 
this is how the newsletters ended up a book and the book kept getting reprinted and then it got discovered by people in Iron March, this very radical neo-Nazi um, web forum and then got picked up by Adam Waffen. So it's the story of how he came to these ideas and then how this very obscure, this very obscure publication became, um, how people enabled, enabled him and helped, uh, helped send him back on his way to popularity or send him on his way to popularity. And, so and he doesn't, he does and the Manson family and neo-Nazis and the underground, you know, music scene of the eighties and nineties, all kinds of, there's all kinds of William Pierce, who wrote the Turner diaries and Tom Metzger. So he got around a lot and he had a lot of weird connections and a lot of it presages things that are going on today, like the Nazi connection with Satanists and, um, leader, Mason was very ahead of the time. A lot of things he said are still current, like advocating leaderless resistance, saying you can't work through the system. It is a sort of proto edge lord. You know, he liked all these just really extreme cultural things. So um, there's a reason he was just, he was one of the few people saying these kinds of things that still sound current if you're a neo Nazi. Yeah. And so you said proto edge lord. I remember I, heard, I kept hearing this phrase. So I looked at it and it was very strange. It was like, it's not like a book. It's almost like posters. You know, it's like very visual. I, I think that's each. Yeah, the original had a lot of images on it. The, the 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 version Iron March made is all text. It's it's oh, cut up into little sections though, because it's 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 a abridged anthology where Michael Moynihan. So the sieges were these six page newsletters, and he cut them up by topic and reassembled them. So they're short pieces too, which uh, makes it more readable. It's very long, but you know, mostly some of them are a few paragraphs. Some of them are like three pages. So. Um, you can read it in, 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 and they're broken up into, I forget, 10 sections or something. So you can pick it up and put it down. And, but he's, he doesn't add to it anymore, right? Like it's, it's, it's basically like an anthology, right? From like the it's 70s. An abridged, it's an abridged anthology of newsletters he wrote between 1980 and 1986. But after that, he, he went to jail and he, he sort of really withdrew after that. Uh, and he started created this very strange version of Christianity that involves like UFOs and anti-Semitism and, and uh, Atlantis and stuff. And he wrote a whole bunch of books about this that nobody really reads because it's not really, it's not really why you're interested in James Mason. He's um, Christian? Of a kind. <laughs> yes, of a kind. So he's worship he's, he's worshiping a goddamn Jew now, huh? <laughs> well, Christian identity, which we haven't really talked about, is this yeah, racist yeah. version of Christianity where the Jews are the white people and the, the actual Jews of the world are fake Jews and the oh, Jews of the Bible are the white people. Um, he, he bases it loosely on that. It, it's hard to describe. He's more like a, a Gnostic UFO guy who claims that things in the Bible are really referring to something else. You know what I mean? So it's it's not very Christian, but it has some Christian trappings. I, I looked into I looked into Christian identity once and it, that pastor Wickstrom, remember mm -hmm. that guy? Yes. He died like, recently. He died and then I looked up like uh, one of his speeches. Today's Jews are not Judea, nor are they Judeans. This is very important to your ministers out here who are going to be listening to this. I really pray you get a notepad and a pen out and you start making some notes here because there's a learning to take place here. <laughs> it's like you have to laugh here, you know, because you'd just be crying. So like I, mm -hmm. I, I see a lot of dark humor. Mm -hmm. It's basically like him and some like militia compound in Michigan. Yeah, it was just he's a him. posse comitatus guy. Yeah. yeah, and it was basically him like, I won't even let my wife bring in bacon. Get it out. Like, oh. like, it's like it's like some bizarre form of like Orthodox Judaism. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. she was yeah. touching the bacon and <laughs> it's, it's strange. Well, other white supremacists hate Christian identity because yeah. they think it's Jewish. That's why you got things like the creativity movement. Uh, cause they were like, oh no, we just worship the white race. There aren't, there aren't Christian identity people who dress up like Orthodox Jews, are there? No, it would Okay, be. that would they be. They think Orthodox Jews are fake Jews. That would be. 
That would be pretty crazy. Well, I just want to thank you so much. I've derived a lot just being able to ask you these questions, and uh, you're just a wealth of knowledge. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, if you'd like to let me have a minute for some self-capitalism. If oh, you'd like yeah, to support, yeah, yeah. No, if you'd no, like to support my work, I don't work for any. I don't get any money from think tanks or universities or anything like that. So I have a Patreon. It's Spencer Sun, you know, patreon.com slash Spencer Sunshine. You can support me there for as little as $2 a month. You can get two exclusive, uh, an essay, and I do these interview questions every month. I talk called Five Questions. I just ask people I find myself interested in five questions about their work, who, who write about or have experience in the far right. Um, so, yeah, if you like what I've said today, please consider signing up on Patreon. Um, and, uh, yeah, all my writings are available almost all for free on my website. It's spencersunshine.com. There's links to all the interviews I've done and things I've written over the years there. 